Welcome to Headlines. This is David Lichtenstein. Here in the Yeshiva Shalmayla, this week we're going to have a fascinating program speaking about dealing with people who have alternative lifestyles. They can be gay, and any one of its many denominations, they call it LGBT. And that's from the Eden, we, we, we react to it almost viscerally. So rather than having an uneducated reaction to it, I figured let's have a real educated discussion, and I suppose a hashkafic discussion, and a halacha. Hashkafic is, the Torah calls it a tayeva. The Torah also calls Seth the tayeva. The Torah says, ki tayeva Hashem kol gvalev. Why is there such a reaction to it? And is it appropriate now that medicine, you know, psychology, which is a relatively new field, has said and proven that there are those who are genetically have a, 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 a predisposition. There is 1%, a half a percent, 2%, I don't know exactly. They're absolutely born that way. And it's doctors, the, the, most of psychology, the vast majority will say it's irreversible by those who are at that end of the spectrum. There's clearly many people who are, you know, there's, there's shades of gray in that spectrum. But there's a, So why do we treat them um, in Yiddishkeit sort of as such pariahs? And halachically, if you know somebody is gay, and they're not, they're not being an advocate, they're not marching or screaming, they're not using the shul as a platform, can you give them an aliyah? Can they, can they, if he's a koyin, can he do birchas kaihanim? Right? Uh, can he uh, be part of a minion? Etc. So we got the world expert on this, uh, who's spoken about this, the esteemed Rav and uh, big Talmud Chacham from London, Rav Chaim Rappaport, the Rav of Ilford. He's Mechaber of Beni Sfarim. Uh, he's, uh, he's also wrote a book called Homosexuality in Halacha. Fascinating. Um, and, you know, here in this program, we believe, we try to see all sides. Everybody's welcome. You have to be, you know, prominent, as knowledgeable on that topic, and you have to respect the Shulchan Aruch as uh, the ultimate arbiter. So we have Rabbi Yehuda Levin. Uh, I know him for many years. He's a famous uh, anti-gay uh, advocate. Uh, if you Google him, he comes at number one. Um, and he has the radio program Levin at 11, very catchy, Thursday night at 6.20 in uh, a.m. To, to present a, sort of a, perhaps another opinion on this. You know, last week we spoke about Ramesh and I said about about Sneas and I said, you know, we here in America we accept Ramesh's psak. And I got a lot of calls. What about Shabbos clocks? Ramesh sort of made Xera if you start using Shabbos clocks and technology, factories will be open on Shabbos. And I do want to differentiate. Ramesh in some areas is making Xeris. And I understand that people say, look, you know, the Xera it changed, times have changed. People do use Shabbos clocks and they don't keep their factories open. And areas where he just paskins halachically, that this was how he saw the halacha, etc. And I do think that's a differentiation. And perhaps at a later show, we'll have one of his uh, either grandchildren or some other prominent rav try to draw that line. Because clearly, we, most people use Shabbos clocks. In fact, this week's show, Ramosh around 70 years ago wrote a tshuva in which he writes that, you know, there is no such a thing as a gay who does it... Um, genetically, but it's all choice. And I think, you know, it's 70 years later and a tremendous amount of research has been done. So these are areas where he's not speaking necessarily from a halachic point of view. He, uh, he, or on that issue, he was speaking more from a hashkafic point of view. So there are going to be areas clearly where times have changed. But again, I think there's a difference between Xavier and where he paskins. This is how he sees the halacha. Now, before we go to our program, I do want to say a word on Shavuos. Shavuos is the Yamtiv of Kabbalah Satira. But remember, the Luchas Rishainis were broken. The Ashabrem Lei he broke them. So why don't we celebrate Kabbalah Satira on Yom Kippur when we got the Luchas that we actually kept, that we remained unbroken forever? That's, I think that's a, a good question. You celebrate the marriage that lasted, not necessarily the marriage that didn't last. And I have another question. Along the same lines, you know, what's the epitaph of Moshe? What would it say on his matzeva? Well, the Torah writes a beautiful epitaph to Moshe. Moshe Reim Mehemna, Moshe Rabban Shol Yisrael. What does it call him? Leikam Navi, the last psukim of the Torah. Leikam Navi Oid Be Yisrael. There was never another Navi in Kal Yisrael. Kamoshe as great as Moshe. 
Asher Yidoi Hashem Panim El Panim. Right? Panim El Panim. This is the Ebbe. He was the Navi, like, um, and what does it end? Chol Hayad HaChazaka Asher Esa Moshe Le'enei Kol Yisrael. The Yad HaChazaka that Moshe did, Le'enei Kol Yisrael. Now, what did he do, Le'enei Kol Yisrael? He gave the Luchais, Le'enei Kol Yisrael. He did a lot of things, Le'enei Kol Yisrael. But Rashi brings the Gemara in Shabbos Pezayin that mentions one thing. What does it say, Le'enei Kol Yisrael? That he broke the Luchais. Shenisoi Libay Lishbar Luchais Le'eneim. Like it says, via Shabram Le'eneichem. He shattered, he cast down the Luchais and he broke them. Le'enei Kol Yisrael. And the Gemara says, Heskiba Das HaKadosh Baruch Hu Le'dayte the Rabbi Nishol agreed with Moshe on this incredibly <laughs> dramatic. He took the Luchais that were written by the hand of God and he shattered them and what does the Rabbi Nishom say to him Yashur Kachachem Yashur Kachachem Sheshibartem thank you for breaking them this is the epitaph the last words of Moshe Rashi says Le'enei Kol Yisrael that he shattered and this is a fun Moshe did a lot of things I mean he took them out of Mitzrayim he crossed to Yamsuf he fed them he brought he brought down the man etc right and what is he remembered for a Kabbalah son, he's remembered for breaking the Luchas. This is, isn't that strange? I mean, that's a funny thing to be remembered for. It's like, imagine in high school, you did well on a base battery. Somebody says, do you remember the time when you got into a big... I mean, yes, I did that, but that's not what I want to be remembered for. So, <clears throat> Chazal do say, why did he break the Luchas? Chazal say, it's a mushal to a, a, an engaged couple, right? A betrothal... And they find out that one of them is cheating. The husbands find out the wife is cheating. Or somebody finds out that the wife is cheating. He says, you know, they really belong together. And they cheated. It was a one-time event. Quick, let's tear up, tear up the engagement. <laughs> so it never happened. There was no engagement. Oh, you weren't engaged yet. Yes, I knew that guy from before. But it really, oh, okay. So you sort of like reverse. Let's do a time machine and go back. That's what he says. So he said, let the, let the hate be pre-engagement. And therefore, because of that, you can have a, then a real meaningful relationship going forward. That's why he broke them. Because there were the Luchashnias, which did happen. But if he wouldn't have broken them, there never would have been a Luchashnias. So what do we, what do Chazal learn from this? That there's a concept of a Lasei Fashem, Hefei Secha. Sometimes we, we wave the Torah, what the Torah says, because Bitula Zuhi Kiyuma, being Mavatalit, that's actually the key of Tyra. Sometimes breaking the rules allows for a relationship to really become meaningful. That's for Shabra Moinechem. Now, this wasn't a one time. Now, it says, Le'enei Kol Yisrael, he did this. So it seems this is a very strong lesson that sometimes Bitula Zuhi Kiyuma. And you know what? Halacha uses this many times in the most powerful ways. And I'm going to give you a few quick examples. Do you know that? It was always Asa to write down Tairi Shebek Sav. Right? What does it say? Soivuchas had Dvarim Eila. What does the Gemara Darshan? Dvarim Shobal Pe E F E Atara Shoy L Oimrim Biksav, the Gemara in Tmura. Right? You're not allowed to write down Tairi Shabal Biksav. Tairi Shabal Pe. Shabal Pe. Tairi Shabal Pe. Tairi is written. Tairi Shabal Pe can't happen. Can't be written. There would be no Bavli, Rishalmi, Sifra, Tisifri, Tisefta, Taras Kayanim, Medrish Rabba, Medrish Tanchuma, Zayar, etc. None of, Shulchan, none of this would be. What happens? Comes Bar Koichva rebellion. It's around 1900 years ago. A million Yidin are killed in, 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 uh, in uh, Israel. On the Bar Koichva, that's what it says, the historians. A million. Most of the yeshivas, the yeshiva, Rabbi Yechon, and Zaka, Yavne, everything's destroyed. Comes Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, just around, I'm guessing, uh, around 1800 years ago. And what does he do? And he says, and the Gemara Darshan's this, Eis Lase Slashem, he says, Mutav Ti Akra Torah. It's better that the Torah we be Oikira Halacha, Val Tishtakach Torah Misra, Bachas Vishalom. So everything we have today, when you walk into the Yeshiva's library, it's your own library, art scroll, all the way back to everything, right, is only because of this. That Moshe was mechadish, ve shabram lei necha, that bitula zuhi kiyuma. We wouldn't have any Torah today. Everything, all the yeshivas were destroyed in the Barakach for rebellion. And this tilei tilam of halachas, because of that, for example, you're allowed to be matzel kisfe, you're allowed to be matzel. If there's a strafe, you're allowed to take out sperm. 
the Gemara in Gittin, that's our, um, um, the Samach, the, the, the Machaber in, the, in Shin Lamedal and Hoch Shabbos says, you're about to be Masal, the Mishnah Bura says, why? He says, because it's all because Eis Las Eis Lashem Hei Fairu Tarasecha, and they gave it the same Kedusha of a real safe, or almost the same Kedusha as a Tarish Abiksav. And he brings, the Mishnah Bura brings Rashi, because this Smayet Halet Levavais, people became smaller, they were diminished. And the Torah would be Mishtaka. So we took this Yisoyed of Moshe Rabbeinu, of Eis Lasse Yisro Hashem, Bitula Hu Kiyuma, and because of that, you're allowed to be Matzal Kesvei HaKadosh. And I'll tell you something else. We're talk, coming up to Shavuos. We say Baruch Hashem. Why do we say Baruch Hashem? Right? So it's, it comes from, uh, um, from Rus. We learn it says, Hine Boyaz Bami Beis Lechem, Vayomer Lekoisrem Hashem Imachem. Right? So the Chazal, the Gemara in Sanhedrin, says that he did it al-pi uh, Bezdin. It's Gemara in Brachas and Samach Gimel. And he said, Baya said, there's so much hate among Jews. People are becoming irreligious. There's Gezel and Oishek all around. People better start using Hashem's name. Because it was, until then, they, never used, they would never say Baruch Hashem. Why? Because they said, it's Maitzi Shem Shemaim, Lavatoli, you're not allowed to. And Baya said, let's start using Hashem's name. Remember to say Baruch Hashem, so that people bring God into their daily verbiage and into their lives and into their actions, so that we remember not to be a Gazlan and not to be Oishek. By the way, you know, famously, Reb Chaim Briska, because he said it's Eis Lasis Hashem, he says it's not clear from the Gemara, the Ramam doesn't bring it down, the din of, uh, of, uh, of Hashem Imachem, that you're allowed to say, uh, be, be, be so Reb Chaim Briski never wrote Baruch Hashem on a letter, and he wouldn't say Baruch Hashem. He says it was only Luzmana, it wasn't forever. He says, yes, for a time, you're allowed to do something, but you can't do it forever. So just to give you an example of how we keep using this halacha. And even lately, you know, it's, 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 it's 1,800 years after the revolt, revolt of Bar Kochva when they destroyed all the yeshivas in Israel. 1,800 years they destroyed all the yeshivas in Europe. And when Rabbi Aaron Kutler opened up Lakewood and they started the Kohl movement, somebody wrote a letter to the Baal Igris Maish, who was considered the Paisik in America, and it's in three different places in Igris Maish, and he says, am I allowed to be paid in Kohl? The Rambam writes terrible things. He says, somebody takes money for learning, ain't like chelik laylam haba, the Rambam writes. Could you imagine? So he said, how could I? And Ramosha writes to him, in a fabulous tshuva, Ramosha says, even though the halacha is usually like the Rambam, but a slase slashem hey feiru tarasecha, and it's practically, he says, it's exceedingly difficult to both learn and work. Very true. And he said, therefore, he says, and yes, we have to take money for learning, not like the Rambam, and he quotes the Kesef Mishnah, etc., Beis Yosef, etc. So this concept of bitula, breaking the rules, allows sometimes, if you want to have a long-lasting relationship, you have to break the rules and look the other way. So here's something really interesting. Okay. So, I heard this story, right? So there's this uh, a rebbe, a small, you know, a rebbe, a chidish rav, like a, he has a title. And he has a, many children, and he has one child who's different. We, very, he says, this son, right away from the beginning, he just didn't learn, he just wasn't so good at learning. And he was 12 years old, for his bar mitzvah, he told, tells my wife, he was afraid to tell me, he says, I want a guitar. So she, my wife comes, she tells me, a guitar, we'll get her to in, in a chsidish a shtub, a rebish a shtub, a guitar. So his wife said, look, he really wants it. He's not doing well in school. He's depressed. So he bought him a guitar. And he said he spent hours. He used to spend days in his room playing guitar. Meanwhile, in the rest of his life, things weren't going so well. So in yeshiva, he didn't do well. He wasn't a good student. He didn't understand well. He was more like artistic, he was more musical. He, he, he was thoughtful. He would ask questions, and he struggled mightily. He didn't do well with so well with some many of the friends. He didn't fit in, and he stopped going to show, and he stopped really going to yeshiva. He says, "But I didn't really pay attention. I have a lot of children." He says, "That it's Tishabov, and I go to David in the morning, and we say Eicha Tol Chatzois." He says, "Can be Bishol Chadarach. You should do it Tol Chatzois. So you should come home, and then you could sit." And I come home Chatzois, and I'm talking to my wife in the kitchen. And my son comes in, and he goes over to the refrigerator. So my wife says to him, what are you doing? He says, I'm hungry. So my wife says to him, 
It's Tishabov. You're 18. It's Tishabov. And he looks at my wife, and then at me, and he says, I'm hungry. I'm making myself lunch. So he said, my wife started screaming, how could you make lunch? And he just opens up the door, and my wife is crying. She so says, I looked at my son, and I said, I called him, and he turned around. He said, and I said to my son, he said, I know you're angry, and I know that you're frustrated, and I know that you're sad. But I want you to promise me to remember one thing. Remember, people could be very mean. People could do, say, really bad things. They could be very hurtful. But that doesn't mean the Tyra is bad. It doesn't mean the Tyra is hurtful. He said, and if you promise to remember this, I'll make you a sandwich for lunch. And he did. He said, this was many years ago. He said, today my son is a wonderful boy. He's got the anger out of his system. So what it says at the end of Shavuot, the end of Kabbalah Satyra, what does it say? What's the, what's the epitaph for Moshe? He broke the Luchais. Le'ene kol Yisrael. For some reason, this is the only thing where it says Le'ene kol Yisrael. He wanted something of that message. Moshe, Re'ya Mehemna, he was the Raya. He connected us to the Rabbi Shalom, And he knew that a connection that doesn't have a way to make some exceptions, to have some understanding, it's not going to last. So, Le'enei Kol Yisrael, Moshe does this to teach us this forever. If we want to have a lasting relationship with the Rabbi Nishalem, or if we want to have a lasting relationship, sometimes with family members, etc., sometimes we have to look the other way. So when do we celebrate Shavuos? Kabbalah Satayra, not the Lucha Shniyas, but the Lucha Yisrishayinus, the Shivrei Lucha that if you want to have luchas that last forever, you have to be willing to break the luchas sometimes. Before we go to our guest, let's do our weekly riddle. Everybody in the world knows the famous Machloikis with the Beis Halevi and, Parsh- and Sefer Bereshis and the Chazaynish and Simon Chavtes of Cotton Gimel. Shemeya Kaina, there's a lacha of Shemeya Kaina. If you hear the Chazan say Chazar uh, Sashatz and you Aina and you weren't, by, by saying the Amen, and by, you don't have to say Amen, by listening, it's as if you said it. Kiddush, you listened, if it's as if you said it. All these halachas, you make the bracha, halachilas matzah, if they want to, they could listen and they don't have to make their own bracha and the yaitza. So there's a machlaik is why it is. Why, what's the halachic basis and understanding of this? Is it, here at Tutsadim, is it, you notice it didn't call a tarakula, shluchai shaladim kemaisai. If I send you to, you know, mar- I want to get married to Rachel and I send you a ring and I say, Aram Mukadeshis Li, Aram Mukadeshis Li Yosef, she's Mukadeshis to the Mishaleach. You can do everything. And American law, it's the same way. You can send a lawyer, a proxy, to, to, to uh, do a contract for you, a sale for you, a purchase. There's a concept of shlichus. But there's another way to look at it. And what is that? Is it that shlichus by, by shemer ka'ayin no? By listening, it's a type of speech. If I listened, it's as if I said it. And this is the uh Is it ka'ayin shluchai? Right, that's which is the, uh, the 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 opinion of the Chazanish, and the Beis Halevi says, says that the actual act of listening is a type of speech. You know, sometimes when you listen, it's as if you spoke. All that person wants you to do is really listen. Sometimes it's even better than speaking. And with the Shmiya, it's like you said it yourself. So here's the problem. We're going to go back to Sfira Saimer. The Achrayim, and this is in Shulchan Aruch. It's Tav Peites. And the Mishnah some, he says that Sphira has to be kol echad la'atzma. You have to count for yourself. Why? Because it says lachem she Sphira lekol echad echad. So Bishlam, according to the Chazanish, who holds it as a din of shlichas, so the Memeli understands the Sfaratim lachem she Sphira lekol echad echad means that here shlichas doesn't work. There are many cases that shlichas doesn't work. So you can't send the shliach to daven for you. 
right? There's a famous Tzaisitz in Kuf Pei Beis, I believe, who says that Shlichas, he brings a Tzaisitz rid, that Shlichas by Mitzvah Sheba you don't have, so Sfira lo kalechad vechad, you can't count it, Shlichas, Shlichas does not help you, count for yourself. But according to the Beis HaLevi, who says that how does Shemeh Ka'inu work? It's not like a regular, it's not B'tai Shlichas, but what? If I listened, listening is a type of speech, so then why don't you say Shemeh Ka'inu by Sfira Saimer, and why does everybody, I, I heard, and it's as if I said it, and therefore I was right. So how, how does the Beis HaLevi uh, understand the opinion of all the Achreinim that you don't say Shemea Ka'ina by Sphira Saimer? That is this week's riddle. Now that we... Oh, <coughs> okay, let me just... Blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's go to our wonderful guests and start our program. We have the honor of having with us on the phone from London, Harav Chaim Rappaport, who was for many years the Rav in the United Synagogue of Ilford, an advisor to Chief Rabbi Lord Zaks. He's the head of the organization, Machon Mayim Chaim. He's published many svarim, including one on Asiyas Kapayim. He frequently publishes in the Ari Yisrael, that, the great periodical in Munsi uh, of contemporary halacha. And he, he's also famously written had the courage to write, I believe, one of the few books that address the topic, and the name of the books is Judaism and Homosexuality, an Authentic Orthodox View. It's an honor to have with you with us, Rabbi Rappaport. Welcome. Thank you. So, Rabbi Rappaport, let me start from a more hashkafa view, and then maybe you could go to Allah. And you feel free to take this conversation where you please, but we do a lot of kirov in my house, and it's very common for us to have Friday night, you know, three, four, five people, many youngsters, college kids who aren't from. I think that's a, there's, a, there's a Holocaust going on in America called the assimilation, a spiritual Holocaust, so we do that. And one of the first questions I'm always asked is, you know, how could you as an Orthodox Jew, don't you believe in justice? And, you know, there are a number of people, whatever the percentage is, say it's 1%, a half a percent, a quarter of a percent, but there is some who have absolutely no attraction to the opposite gender. And to, you know, ascribe these people to a lives of solitude and loneliness seems to be absolutely unfair and unjust. And that is a question, and it's a, it's, to them it's a philosophical question about the, about the conscience of Yiddishkeit, about the, what you would say, the justice, the social justice of Yiddishkeit. If you were sitting at our Shabbos table and had to respond to these youngsters, well-meaning youngsters, how would you respond, Rabbi Rappaport? I would acknowledge that this is indeed a, an extremely difficult question. The question really doesn't belong to the parsha of homosexuality, and uh, I would venture to say not even to the parsha of sexuality. It relates to the most ancient question of theodicy about why the Almighty uh, puts people in such challenging circumstances. The Almighty is not a cool playwright. He is Hanum Rachum. So why would he put people in circumstances that provide them with a near impossible challenge that uh, most human beings are almost inevitably going to fail at some occasion in their lives. And uh, this is uh, a a challenge that uh, comes as a result of the commandment in the Torah, the explicit and unequivocal commandment, uh, forbidding homosexual congress. And joined with the, the God of commandment, the God of providence, who put a person in a situation whereby he has no attraction to the same gender, he only has an attraction to the opposite gender. And this means that the combination of his uh, nature, whether it's nature or nurture, doesn't really make such a difference to me, the combination of his uh, psychological chemistry and the commandment of the Torah uh, puts him in this extremely formidable situation and uh, this is indeed a a question it's a question which is I would acknowledge the question as being an extremely powerful one 
The only thing I would say is that we we have similar questions in other in, in relation to other commandments as well. Um, for example, at least until recently, there was a situation where a woman who ovulated early and was uh, was not able to conceive children if she was to keep the laws of Nida. So. Uh, many people rightfully felt this was an unfair situation. Here you have a woman which God created her biology, and as a result of which she can only have children, uh, at a certain, she can only conceive a child at a certain time in the month. At that time in the month, she's forbidden to engage in marital intimacy. As a result of that, she can't have children. Again, a combination of a commandment and a, um existential circumstance which God made. Is that fair? Does that, uh, does that express our appreciation of what it means an all-merciful and gracious God? One can, of course, expand it to situations where heterosexual people who, for a variety of reasons, cannot get married or cannot, in, cannot engage in intimacy in marriage. They're trapped in marriages in which there is no intimacy that in all of these uh, circumstances, we have people who providence has placed them in a situation where they have to live celibate lives. The alternative would be to engage in premarital relationships or extramarital relationships. That is not permissible according to Jewish law, and therefore we have this question. So, um, so, so in essence, I actually identify with the question, but as a believing Jew, I believe, I, 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 be I believe that this belongs to the category of theodicy, uh, which has been dealt with questions by Moshe Rabbeinu, by David Amalek, by Shleim Amalek, and at the end of the day, uh, you know, as the Chavetz Chaim is uh, as said uh, for, uh, for for the, for the non-believer, there's no answer, and for the believer, there's no question, because we can't grasp the infinite uh, wisdom of the Almighty. However, and here comes the big but: although uh, we are not responsible to answer God and to explain why He would do this, we are responsible for our own attitudes and our own behaviour. And therefore, it is incumbent upon us to behave with great sensitivity, understanding, and um, consideration for people who find themselves in such a plight. And there are many such people across the spectrum. We have to be humane, and we have to be fair. And therefore, whatever we can do, and there's a lot we can do, to be more sensitive than we are sometimes in relation to such people that we must be there and we must be accountable and responsible for our own behavior and our own relationships, our own attitudes towards such people. I know I'm perhaps just uh, even a, a very small thing, a little anecdote. A few years ago, I was giving a share to some boys. Uh, they were about 16 or 17. And one of them asked me, in the, they used to ask questions about all sorts of things that they couldn't get answers to in school. And they asked me, well, what can you tell us about the parsha of Judaism and homosexuality? Uh, so I said to them, today I'll just tell you one thing. When you go to a dinner party in Malava Malka, Shalashudas, and someone makes a joke at the expense of a homosexual individual, a uh, user makes a snide remark, makes a callous comment. Uh, so don't join in. And uh, if you've got the courage, actually silence them. Because it could be that there is someone sitting in your midst who is actually of homosexual orientation himself since puberty. He has never experienced any attraction to the opposite gender. And by participating or uh, showing appreciation for the flippant remark, you're actually stabbing the other person in the heart because he feels that if my friend would know who I really am, 
then he would disassociate himself from me. He would ostracize me. That's all I told these boys, and that was, and they accepted it, and they internalized it. A few years later, one of those boys who had been in yeshiva for several years turned up at my door, and he said that he was actually present on that occasion, and he was considering whether there was any future for himself within the Orthodox community. And, of course, when the subject was brought up, he was very interested about what I said, what I was going to say. And when he heard what I said, this was a green light for him that he can continue within uh, Yadu Sakharidis because there are Abonim that espouse a humane approach in relation to such issues and will always be there to stand by him. So therefore, I think that the question has to be taken away from the divine element and addressed more to the human input. And that's where there's a lot of introspection and careful research that we need to do because I think that we don't always rise to the occasion in dealing and responding to these challenges correctly. So, Rabbi Rappaport, um, I want to f go off on a, a little bit of a tangent, but with something that sort of you intimated. There are those who believe that um, there is no natural um, tendency for SSA, you know, to be uh, homosexual, but it is a choice, and that through therapy it can be changed. Um, after doing a lot of research on it, which, by the way, you know, until 19, I think it was 1974 or some period around that, that zip code, the American Medical Association thought it was a mental disorder. It was a disease. Um, do you believe that um, it is a choice and that it can be changed through one of these, um, you know, psychological, psychodynamic, uh, you know, gender, uh, you know, some type of go there are psychologists who believe they can turn somebody who has a homosexual tendency and make him just regular like everybody else. Do you? What's, what does your research uh, share with us, please? Okay. Firstly, it's important to recognize that there is a spectrum from absolute heterosexuality to absolute homosexuality. But in the case of someone who is wall-to-wall -wall gay, in other words, that he has no attraction whatsoever to women and never has had. The evidence, the research, and uh, the quest over a period of close to 20 years now uh, to meet with people that have changed successfully and uh, sustained that change tells me that there is actually very little to suggest that uh, such therapies are of any ultimate use especially in Judaism, where the point of change would not be uh, that a person could have a short or ephemeral experience with a member of the opposite gender. Uh, it would have to be that the person was able to get married if the change is to be uh, really useful for him. And in order for him to get married, he would have to change uh, almost 100% or as I once put it to a practitioner of reparative therapy, I would only advise him to get married if you would let him marry your daughter. And therefore, since that is extremely remote, whilst I don't rule out any possibility, I have no basis on which uh, to recommend these type of therapies. Um, I think we know precious little about the etiology of uh, homosexuality. Don't forget in the, the, the rabbinic tradition and the Gemara and the Poskim uh, and Lahabdil uh, in, and in secular literature, we don't find the notion of a homosexual orientation. We find heterosexual people engaging in homosexual liaisons. Um, this was an acquired taste, it was a sideline, it was something that was done in ancient Greek, Greece. But the notion 
of a person who is either born with or developed a, uh, an exclusive homosexual orientation is not something which uh, we were aware of um, in, in, in ancient times, and it's only a relatively recent phenomenon that we actually um, know of such people who understand homosexuality in this way. So, um, Re- Re- Rabbi Rappaport, can yeah, I interrupt? Back to the question. No, 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 let me interrupt on this point. Taisvis and Sanhedrin on Tessamid Bays. Yes. Uh, you probably, you're probably aware of it. Says that a mishkav zocher has a din of an oynis and compares it to the oynis of somebody, the the, the yitzray takfei of uh, somebody for let's say an isha. He says for a mishkav zocher it's the same yitzray takfei and has a din of oynis, which would seem to imply that he juxtaposes um, the um, the gay uh, the, you know the the desire of the gay and that of a, an ordinary person to. To an Avera, he puts them side by side and he calls them both an Aynas, Yitzray Takfay Aynas, which seems to imply that it is a natural occurrence. Yes, I wasn't saying that, I wasn't denying that at all. I discussed the Taisvis in my book, and in fact, it's one of the sources that I use to quote that there is a, 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 a bona fide desire uh, amongst uh, people. For a homosexual a homosexual experience, and in fact, I uh, um, discuss this when I dismiss those who say that uh, all homosexuals are just sinning lahachis. It's clear from Tosfos, as it is clear from many other sources as well, that the desire is um, as powerful and as potent as the normal heterosexual desire. What I was saying before was that Christus doesn't say, doesn't speak about a homosexual disposition. It could be that the person that Christus is referring to also had a desire for heterosexual relationships. The notion of a person who desires homosexual relationships exclusively and has no interest in a heterosexual relationship is to the best of my knowledge and I'm not aware of any source till this day that states otherwise not found in classical rabbinic literature. Um, now, with regard to the uh, authenticity, as it were, of the experience of the feeling, first of all, whatever you say, whether homosexuality is completely based on a genetic uh, disposition, or it is learned through early life and acquired through early life experience, I believe that no one, or virtually no one, goes out to acquire it. It's not a choice that someone says, okay, I'd like to be homosexual. It's something which by the time a person is omidaldate, by the time they reach puberty or in their teens, will usually know 100% sure in which direction their psyche is um, is drawn, and uh, so whether it's me better or me later, or whether it's through uh, subconscious influences in one's early infant junior years, the the result is the same. This is not about someone who is shavik hatayr of achilisura deciding to uh, leave aside. Uh, leave the norm um, and go for, for 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 something different. It's clear that it is something which is which is which is which becomes innate. And uh, in fact, um, we know in Allah bechlal the klal of leave your dear moras nafshoi. When we speak to people, and I've spoken to hundreds of people, and we hear their story which is told clearly and unequivocally and uh, with often accompanied with tears and with great feeling. And we, there's no reason, I think it borders on cruelty, to suggest that you know these people are making it up and that uh, they're actually uh, perfectly suitable to engage in, 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 in heterosexual relationships, but uh, they're um, feigning 
wild tears because of some uh, bizarre uh, desire. Uh, this is uh, this is, this is real. This is real. We believe and we trust people. Now the question is, can they be changed? As I said before, I haven't seen that the evidence shows that there is change. I understand the appeal that many rabbis would like to say that there can be change because they would like to have an answer to the original philosophical question that you posed, which was, why would Hashem, why would the Almighty put, give a person such a challenge? So if you say that reparative therapy works, and if you say that reparative therapy works for everyone, and it works quickly and affordably, then you have a simple answer. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you a challenge. Barossi ate Sahara, Barossi reparative therapy tablin. I've got a solution. So therefore, it's extremely tempting in order to avoid the religious theological challenge to say, well, there's a solution. But even if we say, as people like Joseph Nicolosi from North say, or other people, that some people can change, the challenge still remains. Uh, it's just a question of how many percentage. So uh, you might say, okay, so if it's 3% of society, so 1% can change, but there's still two who can't. So whatever the problem, whatever the challenge was in relation to 3% now is relevant in relation to 2%. Now, just to point out that which I was saying before about uh, how in classical rabbinic teachings, the, uh, the, the, the homosexual desire was something that a person who was, was, was indulged in as an additional acquired taste by someone who was essentially heterosexual. You can see that from the Gemara and the Dorin. Because with regard to, to, to all forbidden relationships, including the Isra of Nido, the Torah says, Ki es kol also uh, Then there is an additional time that the, Gemara, the Torah employs the term Tayevo in relation to Mishka Zacha. Yeah, and the Marshal says that the Gemara in the Dorim is focusing on the fact that it's said a second time. And the Gemara says, Toya Atabo, which the Mephorshim, Roshonim, explain, means that this leads you away from heterosexual marriage and interferes with the mission of Piri of Arivia. We find this in Roshonim as well, in the Pirish of Yehuda Chassid al that the reason that the Torah forbade uh, homosexual relationships, at least one of the reasons that we know that we have access to is because it is uh, um, destructive for so it was designed to it takes people away from it's, 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 it's a um, deterrent something which uh, pulls people away from Pruravu now, so clearly we're talking about people that have the option of engaging in normal, normative heterosexual unions, but if they have a boyfriend, so rather than conceive a child, which was inevitable uh, when they had a relationship with a wife, they could then um, indulge in this alternative dalliance. But today... Um, uh, so, so therefore, coming back to today, today the situation is different. We're talking about people who can't get married, and in my opinion, should not get married. Uh, and, 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 and they, they are confronted with this situation. Now, if a person suggests that he's gay, of course he should go to a psychologist and he should be encouraged to explore, especially if it's in his teenage years to make sure that he um, is not going through a period of confusion or a period of um, um, uh, uh, fluid uh, fluidity and, 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 and change, uh, something ephemeral. But, uh, but, but, but if the person uh, he finds that that's the way he is, usually change is not possible, so that is there to stay. And I think <coughs> so we have to swallow our humble pie and say, yes, we, we, um, we, we have to accept that there are people who are confronted with, cha with this challenge, and we do not have an answer. So let me share with you a story 
I believe I heard it from Rabbi Leibowitz, but I could be wrong. He said that in a shul in uh, in the five towns, there was a person who was openly gay, but he was otherwise, he came to shul and he davened, and then one yom tif, he went up, he was a kain, and he went up to, be, you know, to do the C.S. Kapayim, and I know you wrote a safer on the C.S. Kapayim, so maybe that inspired me to remember this story. And he said, and half the Olam walked out. They said, we don't want to get a bracha of a Kayin who is um, gay. If you were asked this question, did they do the right, the wrong thing, or if you were the Rav, what would you advise them to do? I think it's Mephorosh in Halacha that uh, the Rambam says in the Sias Kapayim in Perik Tasov that uh, there are only certain Averis which um, affect the Kayin vis-a-vis the Sias Kapayim, including uh, homicide, Shvich uh, Zdomim. But um, if a person uh, is not uh, guilty of Shvich Zdomim and doesn't have any other impediment, even if he is otherwise not, uh, not, not a fully observant Jew, then I quote you the words of the Rambam, is that Ein Oimim Laodam Rasha Hoisif Rasha Vihimona Min Hamitzvus? That's what the, the, those are the words that the Rambam employs specifically in relation to Nesias Kapayim. We don't say to a non-observant Jew um, that you should just because you do one avera or two averas or many averas that you shouldn't do uh, you shouldn't do this mitzvah. And he goes on to say. And if you say Ma Toil said it, how will his bracha be effective? So the Rambam says, Don't worry about that. The Almighty chose the Kohen as the medium and uh, he will do the mitzvah and the blessing will be forthcoming. That's one thing. Second of all, I don't know what the case was and what type of shul it was. But uh in most shuls, uh, big shuls in the United States of America, there are transgressors of our Yonim of all sorts, and uh, there are some shuls where they only uh, give aliyahs or allow to duchen people who are shema kol tayag mitzvah say bishlemus, or at least they're never caught doing otherwise. But in in uh, in most shuls. Um, we are not only materially spalling of our yonim, but our yonim are allowed to participate. Whether this is because uh, we consider them to be Tenaikas Shanishpu, or for other reasons, the fact remains that uh, they are included in our services, in our tfilis, in our davening. Now, if that's the case with a person who's Michal Shabbos, who is considered in halacha as kegoy l'chol dvarav. If that's the case with regard to people who transgress kalis kevachamurais in areas where they are shavikatera, where there are uh, permissive, perm- permissible options, how much more so ought we to apply the same inclusivism and the same welcome when the person here is... When Tysus calls him an oinus. When Tysus calls yeah. him an oinus. Uh, yes. I don't want to use the term oinus, but I, mean, I didn't take exception to your citation of the Tysus. But what I want to say, when a person clearly wants to be Mekayim or the Mitzvah, but in one very difficult area of his life, uh, he, uh, in one very personal and very, very critical area of his life, he finds himself challenged um, in, in something which most human beings, if, if we asked ourselves the question, what would we do in that person's situation, I wonder how many people would be able to say, yes, I would just um, be able to overcome the Nisoyan and I would remain celibate forever and for all eternity. So, R- R- Rabbi, Rabbi, what could you explain to us? That um, when when I you know when, when I heard the story and a number of other people heard the story about Berachas Kaihanim and it was said around the Shabbos table we discuss it at, you know, um, <clears throat> so the majority of the people said I wouldn't want a bracha, 
And then I would respond and say, by the way, would you give in a person like this an aliyah in shul? And many people said, absolutely not. Would you let him be a shliach tzibur? And again, most people would say not. Now, halachically, ironically, it doesn't, it, it, it's not that way. The Shulchan Aruch in Simenun Hay says that somebody who's only a menudal yidei bezdin is not misarif either to a minyan asara. Um, um, the Mishnah Burin Simenun Hay talks about... Um, that uh, any brings a prima goddam, that any avera that a person's oval a tayavain, you could get an aliyah. <coughs> and the exception, ironically, is the chil shabbos. Um, is is uh, the fact that the amum lechal shabbos and amum lavitas are is considered yeah, like beyond the pale. Yeah, but if but if but otherwise it doesn't differentiate. So here's my question: psychologically, why is it that you see this sadly in so many shuls where somebody who was sat in jail for doing all kinds of theft, Ponzi schemes, ripping off the government, ripping off his neighbors, uh, even child molestation, right? Uh, the craziest things, it's not a question. If somebody's gay, you, you have all the kooks come running out of the windows. Tayeva, Tayeva, gay, gay hina. I, I, I got here on the program screaming when I used to have callers. Why has this touched such a funny bone, such a nerve, where we seem, unfortunately and sadly, in our community to not um, um, regurgitate people who have done really very vile acts against many people who have, who have taken from Almanis and Yusayimim their, their ability to, they will not be able to make a chasana because they've been robbed from these schemers, and a gay person who is like, Tysus says, you don't want to use the word, but on some level he has no choice, and yet with this it hits such a funny, why is this, it seems so absurd and, and unbalanced. Could you explain the psychology behind it? I can attempt to do so. Firstly, um, the cloud in human psychology is that it's very easy to demonize the other, the stranger, you don't know who you've never met, and it's very difficult to um, condemn, to incriminate the person that sits next to you in shul, and you know him only too well. So uh, other of our yonim, which are closer to oneself in more than one way, one can actually identify with their desires possibly, and um, one may have actually been nichshal in similar areas, or uh, one can appreciate, and one knows them as well. They're, they're part of the tzibur. So even though people will condemn them, but there isn't the same degree of aversion. When it's something that a person has never encountered in a serious way, has never even tried to appreciate the circumstances, the nisoyim, the the, 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 the tremendous sense of of of, of um, the, the tremendous tension and and conflict and um, but it, so then the, the 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 person is deemed to be uh, he, he's someone else he's someone out there he's 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 he's, he's distant and if it's distant it's easier to demonize him. Add that to the fact that, um, unfortunately, the gay culture, as it's called in the United States, has, uh, at least um, until recently, not done, um, uh, often uh, displayed, projected an image of being quite um, vulgar, promiscuous, indulging in ephemeral relationships and etc etc so um, whilst there are those who are different and those who want to be different that doesn't add to the that, that, that sort of adds to the fuel um, considering the fact that until recently people didn't know didn't understand it and um, even till today mo many people if not most people don't really understand it don't really know such people so it's very easy to say, ah, these people are either crazy or shoyim or, or something like that. Um, once you get to know, as you have got to know people, 
that uh, for them this is a very real um, issue, and in all other ways they are fine people. In fact, uh, the, the the most difficult challenge is that they don't have the inner serenity. Uh, the they they can't reach that holistic state of being whereby what they their entire life is, is is in accordance with what they believe, and that they fall short of that. So then you, you actually begin to see these people not as uh, the the worst on the list of transgressors, but actually in a certain sense the highest, because as you said, this person was a shaynu mitzvah. He came to Shulter Davin. He learned. He, 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 there are many people who. Daven three times a day, they learn Shurim, they learn Dafyomi, they do everything. And this is one area in which they struggle so tremendously. So uh, I, I personally don't see any reason why, these, why, why such people should be penalized, certainly more than any other people who don't keep, uh, who don't keep all the halachas, especially taking into consideration two things. One is, Rabbi Sasuras, Ramba Menuhus Chura, Beis Halachates, and also in, in Shmaina Prokim, Pergavav, says are included in Ben Adam Lamokim. I mean, uh, if it's two consenting adults, there's no, um, there's no victim here. Uh, whereas some of the other crimes that you were referring to, concerning which the Gemara says, Koshin Ancient shall Midas Yesemi Ancient shall. Arroyos. Secondly, uh, if you, for example, give an aliyah to someone who is married out or to someone who is a fraudulent business dealer, there's always the possibility that if there's a young man in the community and he sees that even the even the fraud can be a chosen Torah or a chosen brachis, then maybe it isn't so bad as long as you give a necessary the right contribution to the right institution. But if you give an aliyah to the individual that you were describing before, is there really a hashash that as a result of this, people who are heterosexual are going to try and become homosexual? You know, let me... Is there really a a Lamigda Milsia? I doubt it. Rabbi Rabbi Rapport, I I remember years ago, my father told me a story that um, the the Ostrafts have fasted for 40 years. But he was also, he was the rub of the city, so he used to walk Shabbos, and when the storekeepers were open Shabbos, he would go in and give them Musa. So there was one storekeeper who was a shtikel of He told the Ostraf to Rebbe, I'm a Chal Shabbos, but you're also a Chal Shabbos. So he said, why? He said, because you fast on Shabbos. So the Ostraf to laughed, and he said, it's true. But nobody's going to learn from my Baveris, and they're going to learn from yours. All right. So, no. <clears throat> Rabbi, Rabbi Rappaport, let me ask you a question. Uh, I want to sort of, um, this is a real life event, okay? So I've published and on modern halacha, contemporary halacha. So I get a lot of calls and I get a request from a boy. He's coming back from one of the largest yeshivas in Eretz Yisrael. And he very nervously leaves a message. Can I call him? And he says it's, so, he said it's pikuach nefesh. So when you hear a call like that, you respond, so I called the boy. He says he would like to come to my home and talk. He says it's something very confidential. And so I said, okay. So he comes to my home and he says he's come, he's come back from one of the big yeshivas in Eretz Yisrael. And he's 24 years old, or 23 or 24. And he's never had any attraction whatsoever to the opposite gender. To the point, he says, if he would see somebody from the opposite gender, unclothed, disrobed, would be the equivalent of seeing a cat. It means absolutely nothing to him. Right, like the Gemara says. <clears throat> so so he, he said to me that he has attraction to the same gender, right, SSA, um, and um, he, he's been re- being read Shadduchim, and he says he, he obviously knows, he, he says, I could fake it, but I realize that I'm just going to be dooming a girl to a lifetime of unhappiness. He doesn't want to do that. But he says he just doesn't know how he can live a life of solitude. And he says, on the other hand, he says he doesn't see leaving Yiddishkeit as an option. He says, I love Yiddishkeit and I love learning 
and I like davening, and I love my family. And he says that the stress of it is killing him. And what's his, what type of life can he lead? What should he possibly do? And it was very emotional. I'm sure it was, and I've been in a similar situation many times myself. I think that, uh, first of all, I'm pleased that this boy uh, decided that it was incorrect for him to draw a young woman into a relationship in which he wouldn't be able to give her what she deserves and what she needs. And not only that, but actually he would be drawing himself and her and any children that they may give birth to in the course into a disastrous situation, which is going to lead to a lot of heartache and, uh, and uh, you know, when the marriage falls on the rocks, eventually uh, a lot of pain for so many people. And I would like to use this opportunity to raise awareness and to alert people that uh, sometimes it happens that people go to a rov or to a therapist and they say, don't worry, you'll get married. The way to a man's heart is through his stomach and she'll make a nice chicken soup and you'll buy her flowers and it will end up being okay. Now, even if these advisors are well-meaning... They're over like Samad al They're right for him, these advisors. They're right for him of the girl. Yeah. And, and, and in a way of the boy as well. Uh, it's, 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 uh, and even if they disclose... Uh, the, the girl, especially if she's a from girl from a Bisyakov seminary, she doesn't necessarily understand at that stage... Uh, the dynamics and the significance of of all these factors. Now, um, when people ask me what what do I do if I don't change people from homosexual to heterosexual, um, my answer is that I try and achieve four things. Firstly, to save the lives of homosexuals, that they shouldn't lose them to depression, to suicide, to drugs or to temporary promiscuous relationships. Second of all, I try to save their families so they shouldn't lose their parents, their siblings through mutual ostracization or um, uh, the type of feuds that can occur. Thirdly, I try and save their community life through making sure that their erstwhile peers and yeshiva friends don't alienate them, and vice versa. And finally, and most importantly, that they shouldn't lose their creator, their God, by dismissing it because they not they don't feel able to, they feel they have to take everything as a package deal. And it's either all or nothing. There are very few people that have succeeded in living a celibate life as homosexuals, but there are some. And there are those who've left Yiddishkeit, but it has been a great clap for them, besides, and also for their families. And um, I very much encourage people not to see things in binary terms, but rather to um, accept that in life, as all of us, we all have challenges. Uh, there are very few people across the, across the board of orthodoxy who can say that we are able to live up to all the commandments. Uh, people uh, make discounts for themselves, sometimes on a one-off basis, and more often than not on a regular basis, in relation to certain mitzvahs and certain avers. The fact that that is wrong, that's true, but it would be more, it would be much worse and lamentable if they were to decide that um, therefore we're going to throw the towel in. Um, only the Almighty knows at which stage a person's design becomes unbearable and at which stage a person, what is uh, the so-called Nakuda Sabhira is, where he is able to choose. I can never say to a person, I believe that this you can do or you can't do. The truth, however, is that the problem is, will the Orthodox society allow him to stay within, 
will they ostracize him, disenfranchise him uh, because of his misguidance? And um, will 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 uh, will he be given a place? You know, even for heterosexual singles, very often people feel out of place. If we're not married, we're not people. A lot has come of a come of someone who is so different. And um, I think that uh, whilst we remain loyal, 100% and committed to the teachings of the Torah, and that which is Osir is Osir, and that which is Mutter is Mutter, in the same way that we have managed to find room for so many different people who aren't able to live up to the letter of the law, uh, for perhaps less compelling reasons than in those related to homosexuality, it is a challenge of our community to be able to find a place and to fight both in our hearts, in our homes, in our communities, in our schools, uh, so that we should be able to include also those who are challenged in this particular way for reasons best known to Hashem. Obviously, there's always the condition that they respect the, 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 the uh, ethos of the shul, place that they're going to, and uh, and they, they, they don't, we're not talking about people who try to use the shul as a, a gay lobby or to promote uh, forbidden uh, events, we're talking about people as people. There are so many out there, and there are a Bonim, and there are Rashi Yeshiva who have understood this, and who have been extremely welcoming. How this particular young man approached you will be able to navigate his way through life, I don't know. I can easily understand his temptation to fake it and to do so much just for appearance's sake, even though he knows that that's wrong. I can also understand his temptation to completely leave I think that he should be encouraged to walk the tightrope because ultimately in terms of what life has to give him and he has to give life that is the correct approach and if he does so he should be viewed as a hero as a, someone who has undertaken a Herculean challenge and uh, faced it with dignity he should be given every possible support and every possible friendship I, I'm always scared even though I've spoken about many these issues many times, but every time I doubt that I shouldn't, I shouldn't deviate uh, wrongly, the Yemen oil is smell to the right or to the left in this presentation. I can't keep quiet because if I were to do so, it would cost people lives. Many people have been able to remain alive physically or spiritually because the issue is now able, people are able to speak about it. And many, many, many people have been saved from terrible marriages because we're now speaking about this issue. On the other hand, I know that speaking is dangerous. There's always a chance of being inaccurate. So I hope and I daven that I should always be able to... Um, maintain the healthy and correct equilibrium um, of, on the one hand, uh, of, being, of being loyal to all the dimensions of Torah mitzvahs, uh, not in any way compromising the mitzvahs and the surim of the Torah, and at the same time, which, 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 which include the, is, the surim against the surim biyah, and at the same time, not to compromise the other mitzvahs in the Surim of the Torah, which um, are sometimes in Yonim of Pekuach Nefoshes, and to espouse the values of Ahav Tolayach HaKomoycha, and um, to, 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 to be Matzil Nefoshes Mi Yisroel, uh, both Begash Mi Yisroel and Baruch Nis. 
it's a difficult balance, uh, and it's one that uh, we face with trepidation. But at the same time, we do so um, knowing that this is our obligation, and um, well, Rabbi Rappaport, it's it was an honor to have you with, on with us, and I applaud you for having the courage to address this very sensitive situation. And uh, like, like I once heard Shlomo Mechabal said, he said, Everyone, everybody wants to be the Rebbe of the Shane Eden. There's not a lot of people who have the courage to be the Rebbe of the, those who suffer and those who struggle and those who you don't necessarily get a lot of covet from. And I think, like you said, you've saved many lives and uh, you're an inspiration of rabbinical courage. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Yashikar. We have on the phone with us uh, Rabbi Yehuda Levin from uh, New York City, and I've known him for many years. Um, Rabbi Yehuda has been uh, one of the um, strongest advocates um, against gay rights, etc., and he's uh, been a Talmud. He was close to Rabbi Vigdor Miller and many other Gedalim. He also has a show on 6.20 a.m. on Thursday evening at 11 p.m. It's called Levin at 11. You can't, you can't uh, forget that very catchy name. So welcome, Rabbi Yehuda. Thank you so much. I'm a pleasure to be with you, Rabbi David. So Rabbi Levin, what would you say to the following story? Um... A boy calls, actually, uh, a, well, he leaves a message, and he says he wants to speak to me and he um, about a personal thing that he's not comfortable speaking about, but he feels that since he's uh, read some of my books or he's with, he feels like he would have an ear, a sympathetic ear. So I, I don't have a lot of time in my life. So I said uh, the only t- two times, usually it's only Sunday that I have any time at all. <clears throat> so I made up an appointment. He came over, and he... He, he said, let's take a walk. So I walk with him. He says he came back from a big yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael a little while ago. And he has zero attraction to the opposite gender. He said, since he's a child. And I realized, he, he, he actually told me when he left the message that it was Pikuach Nefesh. So that's why I agreed to. And he said he has zero attraction to the opposite gender. And um, he's been to a psychologist. And the guy said, look, you know, what can I tell you? This is how you're wired. And he said, to the point, he said that if he sees a member of the opposite agenda totally without, uh, disrobed, it's like looking at a cat or walking in the street. It's nothing to him. But he does have a strong attraction. His attraction is to the same gender. So he said, you know, I said, you're not, you're not thinking of dating. He says, he says, no. He says, I know enough to know that it would be a big avala to the girl. But he says, I'm marooned to a life of just loneliness and celibacy. And he said, I don't know, understand to it, hashkafically how to deal with it, on a, on a practical level, how to deal with it emotionally. And he said, could you help me deal with this? How would you respond to somebody like this? I'm not God. I didn't create people with cancer. I didn't create people with all kinds of impediments. I didn't create people who want underage children. I didn't create people, like the Gemara speaks about, the fellow who wanted to adulterize somebody, and there's a discussion in the Gemara if he's allowed to pass through the window. So, right, and she should just, he should just be able to look at the lady because the doctors say if not, he's going to get sick, he's going to die, whatever it is. So first of all, I would show some humility, and I wouldn't try to put myself emotionally just and say the quick fix stuff or anything like that. I would tell him, Tzadik Ziskite, you're a Ben Taira. Look at what that Gemara says. What does that Gemara mean to us? that if a guy says, I'm going to die, and the doctor says he's going to die, if he doesn't see a penuya walking in front of his window, we say he should drop dead, and we don't go along with him. Okay, so, so when I just, we just Googled you, you right before we started, and it says, gay people are the cause for earthquakes. Okay, people, um, well, uh, let's respond. Let me, let's not waste another minute on this. I'll tell you the story. Yeah, you're, talking, you're talking about the gays who advocate for, for, for that we should have gay rights and make a whole taram. That's what you mean. No, 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 no. Wait a second. Slow. We don't even have to get into the advocates. Listen carefully. In Haiti, there was an earthquake that caused 300,000 people or something like that to die within the last 10 years. 
On the right. Christian stations, they're still raising money for the impoverished Haitians, legitimately. Right. Haiti right. is attached, it's attached to the Dominican Republic. It's one island. Correct. It's fascinating statistics that the United Nations published that for several hundreds of years, natural disasters to Haiti were tenfold as severe than to the Dominican Republic, which is in the same island mass. It's La Yumaki Super. LMI, some Catholic group came up on an internet, I found the site, and they said, you know the difference? The difference is that the United Nations tells us that Kimat in, the, in our hemisphere and maybe in the world, the biggest per capita incidence of homosexual practice is in Haiti, not in the Dominican Republic that's much less. So guess what? We see a key of the sixth parak of the Yushalmi and Baruchas, that says, I think on the Posik, maybe I'm misquoting the Posik, but Vatirat Ha'oret Vatigash, the Gemara gives several reasons you shall me for earthquakes, and it says like this, let me share the lotion with you. I don't waive consecutive translation, everybody should understand. You have shaken your male member in a place it doesn't belong. I will shake the world. Now ask me your question again about that headline, please. Ask me the no, question, so, David. So, 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 Rabbi Levin, what you're suggesting is, is that when bad things happen in the world, right, we could go around and look for Gemaras that explain it. Is that fair to say? Well, I'm so, for, so, for example, so, for example, Rabbi Levin, when you Rabbi have Yehuda, an accident, Rabbi Yehuda, if you have a, an Erlicha person who had an accident and he, something terrible happened to him, I'll serve you six Gemaras that explain why bad things happen to people. Ain't me sibly hate. I could start rattling up. So we should say, this person, he looks like a very Erlicha person, but we'll find in the Gemara reasons that maybe the terrible things are happening in his family that we don't know, and that's why these bad things are. So if you advocate that, that's fine. I just want to know if you do it consistently across the board in the Fruma community as well. I personally don't think that we rise to the level of a Navi to be able to say why things happen in the world, but there are people who feel that they could Nobody. take tragedies and give titles onto them, like, you know, you, 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 your wife didn't do this bit sneers, your husband didn't do this, they, they didn't cut the, the baihud and whatever, maybe, it's fine. I just want to point out, there's, so let, but let me ask you another question. The Gemara gives I'm not 10 different reasons. Well, me, me, but I want to respond to your other point first. The, the Gemara gives 10 different reasons why bad things happen. Like, for example, because you didn't get up for Kriyashma on time. Do you ever wonder that maybe it didn't because you didn't get up for Kriyashma by time? Or the Gemara says because Dayanin passed bad deed. You have one Gemara. I could, I'll rattle off 10 Gemaras. I know a lot of Gemaras. Why Churban Bala Olam? So, because Talmidim don't pay attention. Have you maybe thought of the other options before you decided that it's... The, that is the Gemara of Mishkeve Zachar by Amalek. Wait, wait, but, but yeah, I'll tell you what the problem is, okay? I think that <clears throat> somebody who takes a stand against uh, gay advocacy, against, uh, you know, uh, transgender, I, 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 I say that people certainly have a right to take such positions. I recognize there's, there's people who are more liberal, left, etc. But what I just raise my eyebrows is when somebody says when something bad happened is I'll find the Gemara why that happened. And like that you said happened in Haiti and there are other quotes from you online too. I just say that I'm, I am too, I'm too far to really understand because you have one Gemara, I'll give you four other Gemaras why other things happen. And I don't think that I have the... The, the That's arrogance cool. to say why the Rabbi Nishar, I don't know why the Holocaust happened, and I don't know why people die of cancer, and I don't know why do you have ch children that are born autistic, and do I have a whole bunch of Gemaras that I could roll out? Yes, and I don't, I don't think, and I don't think not me, and I don't think any Godel in the world, it was never accepted by, by, by Unzer Gedolim to say, why did the Holocaust happen? Because so-and-so did this. Why? I don't think we have the ability to do that. I mean, so I, if you do it, I'm just remarking on it, nor am I even oh, criticizing it. I'm saying it's an unusual kayak. Let me move to, we belabor this. You, for example, one of the things you say is that they should use um, chemical, um, I cure gays with chemicals. Uh, that's uh, when you, w it lights up when you're doing, can you give explain us a little bit of, a little bit of color on that? I'll explain it to you. Very good. The word that you're, th you're searching for, which I didn't use, they used it, they, they educated me, is called chemical castration. Let me explain it to you. 
And I'm so thrilled with this dove, and I'm begging you. I'm begging you because we've known each other for 50 years or more. I'm pleading with you. If you can't put this whole thing unedited onto the radio, I beg you as a chava, give me the tape and let me put it on without editing on the Internet and let people judge because I think this is very educational. It's a culture comp for values and a religious culture comp, and I love it. Now let me answer you on the chemical castration. There's a fellow... He's very proud, so I'm not saying any Russian horror. His name is Levin. His name is Levin. He's a Lubavitcher. He's now in his high 20s. When he was 13 or 14 or somewhere around then, he was molested by his cousin, who also has a prominent family name in Klal Yisrael. And it really it should be able to be Mepharsimit because it's public knowledge, but I'm not going to be Mepharsimit. And because of that, the statistic is that 30 to 35% of kids who become molested develop an affinity for homosexuality. This is not Yehuda Levin's statistic. This is an accepted statistic. He became, he became a passionate Mishkav Zohar. He co-founded with a great nephew of Rav Yeruchim Levavitz, the Mashkiach. He co-founded an organization called Jewish Queer Youth, and he's an absolute advocate. He went to Naomi Maurer, whose father of Shalom class was Eish Lahava against the homosexual agenda, the militant homosexual agenda, and he tells Naomi Class, do you know that kids are committing suicide, including Jewish kids? And he does a whole sob story, and therefore, you people are responsible. So she says, oh, you say, what should I do? I mean, she, you know, what should I do? He says, I want to write an article in the Jewish press about bullying and the dangers and everything else with the Mishkav Zachar, the whole business. Uh, in other words, a puff piece for the whole homosexual agenda to put it in the Orthodox newspaper. She says, okay. She says, okay, and he writes this disgusting piece where he plays with every, every uh, aspect of political. They're very clever in the way they present, you understand. So I I'll call up Jason Mose, who was until recently for 20-some-odd years the editor, Jason says, I've been waiting for your call, Levin. I knew you were going to want to put in an article, but Naomi said, you're not allowed to put in a, an article response. You know, like Rush Limbaugh, fight with my hands tied behind my back, you know. So, okay, so what can I do? So he says, if you put in a letter up to 450 words, I will edit it, and we'll put in the letter. I worked out a letter, and I wrote like this. If a person has cancer, a child, and the parents take him to one doctor, two doctors, three doctors, do the parents say, Ad Khan, we stop? Or as long as there's life, we try, and if we can't do it with conventional, we try alternative because we care. I said, listen here, Mr. Levin, you wrote an article, and I quoted the Gemara that I told you about looking into the window. You see, I start the Chazal off. But he took that out, Jason Mose, because he's not a Talmud Chacham, and he doesn't understand the ramifications. But I wrote this, and he put it in. I said, listen here. If, if in Sweden... Is a very liberal country. They have a child molester in prison. He has a 10-year sentence. Now it comes time to take him out. And we know the recidivism rate on child molestation is stratospheric, because the taiva is there, kemat la'olam. Vos tutman, society has a problem. You know what they do in liberal Sweden, I wrote? In liberal Sweden, they say like this. You could take the equivalent of what used to be called in the 50s, saltpeter, that diminishes the libido and the ability to fornicate. And if you do that every week or whatever it is, and you check in with the parole officer, you can free to go. If you refuse, you've got to stay in prison because we've got to protect society. So I said, Herzegein, you make a David, now I'm turning it on David Lichtenstein. What do you want from Steve Ashkenazi? The woman is like a rock. I'll tell you what I want. God gave you this Nisoyin, I don't know why he gave it to you. I said publicly on radio, in, on Alan Combs' program, when I was debating this, there for the grace of God, he could have made me want underage girls, underage boys, he could have done everything. So I'm not making light of it. What I'm saying is practically, as a from a yid, you go if you have to, and you have these tithes, instead of indulging yourself, take the salt, Peter. So that's what I wrote. Okay, Do so that. can I ask you... Rabbi Huzal, let me ask you a question. It's an interesting debate. Would you say that somebody who has a big tithe of Lush and Hara should have his tongue cut out? 
Stop it. You, you, I don't know. I'm just, I'm asking you, you in other words, you, you're selling forth a, a, a thing. I'm not. If a guy's a Baltiza, you're saying a, a Baltiza, and he could medically reduce his ability to have a, a virus, right? You're Robert, saying. You want, so an just, you want yeah. an answer? Let me tell you an answer. You and I both know the Medrash with, uh, what, uh, what was his name? With Mafia Ben Mecharsha, I forget his name. Remember yeah. the Mice? Mafia Ben Mecharsha, what? You don't remember the Mice? You have he, to start, and I'll tell you. Sutton came, the Sutton told God, oh, he's a big man, I hear the head. Yeah, yeah. God said he's a yeah. big man. He yeah. says, I'll tell you what, he created himself the most beautiful person that was ever the, the woman, and he comes into the room, so he turns his head, he turns his head, and, and he keeps on tancing around him. It's Hazal, it's a medrash. So he tells his friend, his, his Talmud, to take a sword and stick it into the fire. He sticks it into his eyes, and he knocks out his eyes. And it says the Sutton was Nizdazea, and they wouldn't cure, he wouldn't allow that the malice should cure his eyes until he was promised he wouldn't have the tithe again. Now, I'm not advocating this cues there, not on Russian horror, not on anything, but it's interesting that you said this because the Chazal telling us this medrash is for a reason. I am only smart in one area, I told you. You're much smarter than me in every other area of night, life. I don't have any money. I'm not smart in business. I don't have any secular education. I don't have anything. I have one thing. I'm an automaton that was programmed by Rev. Vigdor Miller, the Kasha Verov, Rev. Moshe Halberstam, 40 years debating this on TV, radio, the Goyim, this and that. And in this thing, I feel very secure what I'm saying. And all of your exaggerated questions, they're not applicable, David. Why don't you come over to the right side of things and spend some of your abilities and because, your energy... Rev. 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 Rehuda, I'm just pointing out that the, the concept of Chemical yeah. castration, which, by the way, I read in Gera they do that too for boys who, uh, who uh, uh, they, they think are over chathis urim. There was a whole article. I think that it's, it's a chiddish because then we would start cutting the hands off of people who are multiple ganavim who get shlishi. Besides not giving them shlishi, we should cut their hands off. We should talk the tongues off of Bali Lashon Hara. We should cut the feet off and the fingers off of boys who access pornography. So I'm just pointing out that it's... Rabbi Levin, let me ask you, let me go on a different point. If somebody is gay and they can't halt the chayin, he says, look, I just can't, and he, and he has a relationship with another guy, right? Oh, now, now the rubber is hitting the, the, the asphalt. Right? Go ahead. So yeah. my question to you is, you have a shul, Mavak Hashem. Would you, have, would, you yeah. allow him to, would you allow him to daven in your shul? He does a bit uh, sinner. Is, he does a bit sinner. He doesn't tell anybody. He's not a gay advocate. He's not marching. He's not going in the gay day parade. He's not voting. He's he's quietly. He's nichshol in this oven. He's right. he's he can't be like Yosef at Tzaddik, etc. Would you would right. you let him to oven in your shul? I'll answer. I'll tell you. I'll answer you. I'm not sure if you have your own minion or not. But let me let me turn the table and ask you the following question: If you know that there's a guy in your shul, you're the rough, and you know that he is cuckolding his friend, and he's having an erva dika, a rias dika, znus with an aceous ish. You tell me what you'll do. Okay, so I would tell you this. According to uh, the Shulchan Aruch, he's a ladder. Okay. That's, that's the simple answer. Would I feel good about it? I think that when somebody is hurting somebody else, it's been Adam L'chaveray, it's not necessarily... In, in our place to be moichel for the other person. When something has been adam lamakim, it's a different position. So if you asked me la halacha what it is, I would say he's a ladu. Whether you would say, would I feel different? I would feel different about somebody who's hurting somebody, ben adam lachavere. If I knew I had a guy who was beating up his, his wife and kids, I'd have an issue with it. And somebody's doing ben adam lamakim, there's a rabbinic shalom on the world. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's, yes. he, he's, there's, a di- there's an aid and there's a, there's a din and there's a dying. That's what I would say. Here's, here's my answer. I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Here's my answer. If I know that the guy is having an adulterous relationship with somebody else's Jewish wife, then, then I feel that if I know it, it's already not the Vom Shabbat Sinner. And if I know it and he wants to come in and march in, it's a good, speaking about Tayeva, it could be that his tefillahs are tayeva. I don't know. It's, it's, it's gan shaykh, but it's a chuch of a tulula, and by me accommodating him, I might have a problem. Rabbi Levin, let me ask you a question. Do you think among, uh, from the Jews, right, do you see that, you know, white-collar crime 
is more prevalent than this issue? I, I would think so, right? Um, white collar crime, Geneva, etc., like this, right? But yet in, in Schulz, they would give somebody with a white collar criminal, right? Yeah. They would give him shlishi or shishi, whatever the thing may be, whereas somebody who is uh, 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 gay and has an assign, and if he's, tr- if he's truly gay, means he's, Tysus calls him an oinus on some level, which means he has absolutely no option. He can't earn a living honest. He can't earn a living honestly and earns this honestly. No, and yet, you would say that I, f- I have a bigger problem with him than with the Ganif, with the Goslin, with the guy who's, who's constantly being Michal Shem Shemayim. Do you see anything wrong with that or no? The basis of Ben Adam Lechaveray is tied inextricably in Ben Adam Lemokam. And what governs Ben Adam Lechaveray, David, get this, yeah. I, I'm saying this, maybe I'm wrong, is Ben Adam Lemokam. And what's my raya? Yahafta Lereacha Kamoicha is contextualized by the end of the Pasuk Ani Hashem. The only way to get to Hashem is to Ben Adam Lemokam, but it's just like Kavere Savicha and Shabbos. It's all within the context. We could be covered as a but if he tells us to be Mechal Shabbos, we're not. And our Bein Adam Lamakam, our sensitivities, because the Gemara says somebody who's Merachim, when he should be not Merachim. Kol Hamerachim. Kol Hamerachim al Achzorim, Saifil Achzor al Rachmadim. That's the Vaima you mix in, whatever. Yes. It ties in with that Rambam, and it ties in with that Rambam, and your overemphasis on the sensitivities of people and your moral equations when we're talking about Zdus, which brings down Kal Yisrael, it's the head of Kedoshim to you, this whole movement, and, 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 and if the Torah affects us and anything else, but even... We're listen, not talking about the movement, we're talking about individuals. I'm not talking about movements, I'm talking about individuals. I'm talking about if you had in your shul somebody you know who was, who was Batsina, he had a thing, Right? We're not talking about movements, we're not talking about, uh, about earthquakes, we're talking about how would you deal with somebody like this? Would you deal with empathy and say this person is an oinus and I don't know if I could live a life of celibacy? Or would you start I... quoting my marim from Rabbi Vigdamilla? And, and I... your, your attitude is, is that Ben Adam Lamakim starts with Ben Adam Lachavere, starts with Ben Adam Lamakim, so can I play him by because that's Ben Adam Lamakim. Is that what you're saying? You know Kanoyim Poygumbay is not applicable here in Gansan, but you, you know that. But, but the point is, I was on the Alan Combs radio program, and a guy called me up, and I said, but Robin, there for the grace of God, what if I had desires for underage girls? What if I had a desire for Asus? What if I had the, the challenges? I'm not trying to minimize it. I'm telling you, you would lend the excuse of a lot of things. I'm not a liar. I'm very transparent. I'm, 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 I'm not prevaricating or being... I'm telling you, I do not hate anybody who goes through the tithes and, 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 and uh, what do you call it, uh, succumbs. What I do absolutely loathe is when you want to march about it, you want to elevate it, you want to... Uh, uh, we, uh, we agree on that. We agree. I agree with you. Well, therefore, I am sympathetic to the individual. So, Rabbi Yehuda, so, so then in closing, would it be fair to say, okay, let's tell me if then if I say that we would agree, right, that first of all, somebody who is in that one or two percent, whatever the number may be, who is, you know, on the spectrum where he really has no attraction, right, so it's not a choice. So first of all, he's an oinus. He, he, he didn't want to be created that way. He would love to be created normal. If he's a shaymerit, you call him Yosef, you call him a tzaddik, I certainly agree with that. If he's nichshel, right, you say you have empathy for him, and you say if I were born that way, who knows if I could live a oh. celibate life. Oh. And, and your, your, the, your main opposition is to the people who so quote-unquote gay pride and turn it into a, a something to be proud of, and you and say it's nothing more to be proud of than any, and legislation, it's nothing Ooh. more to be proud of than any other, it's, 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 it's just, it's, it's an unfortunate, we don't, we don't understand why Kaviyachal does this, but to transgender, to make this a cause and a mission, and a cause celebre, is something that you're opposed to. Is that and what you're to, saying? 
right and to push it in the school. And I think Rabbi, Rabbi Levin, at the end, we, I think we agree on on ninety percent. No, no, the, only, the only thing I don't agree is is labeling why terrible things happen to people. I don't think that's be a day new. Okay, Rabbi Yehuda, it's, it's it's wonderful talking to you, and uh, and I certainly you should continue. You know, those who are like Lahashmi, the Laharig, and they're screaming pro. It's 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 terrible. It's mamish hepachatayr, and on that area, certainly we agree. So thank you very much for your time. All the best, the culture. Culture.